I'm Del the Trader, and welcome to Bear vs. Pig. This is a series of interviews with seasoned day traders who have found themselves trading inside one of the stock market's most volatile and shrouded niches. These are traders that have managed to break through the gauntlet that is discretionary day trading, they've become profitable, and have emerged on the other side triumphant. Let's lift the veil and begin exploring the minds behind this niche. Welcome to episode 4. Today we're interviewing Smash from SmashTheBid.com. Smash has been investing and trading since 1998. And what I find so interesting about his journey is um, how he transitioned from trading low float small cap stocks like the rest of us into using options to scale his strategies into both day trades and also longer term swing trades. So as you'll hear in the next hour, his focus and entrepreneurial spirit have led him into a position where he's executing his strategy every day. He's reducing his overall costs in the market, maximizing his gains, and building that generational wealth. Smash, welcome to the episode. Thank you, Dell. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I've been uh, wanting to have you on uh, for quite some time. We interviewed Jay Trader on episode two. Two, um, and uh, I know that he has a room inside of the Smash the Bit community uh, where you guys kind of split your uh, your tasks between large caps and small caps. He's quite a good trader too, and that was quite the interview. Cool story too. Good background there. Great. Um, all right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you trade right now, um, and also about Smash the Bid. Okay, sure. So right now I primarily focus on large caps um, and trade options to supplement my trades. Um, I do have a trading community here. It's full of uh, some really good traders, some beginners, you know, some experts. We've got we've got a, the full gamut. We've got uh, Jay Trader on Twitter. He does the small cap room and he's very knowledgeable with the small caps. And uh, we do some stuff together, work together uh, some days where we talk about large caps and small caps. So um, it's a great community, a lot of good traders, a lot of beginners. Um, we we have a no nonsense approach to teaching. We'll, we share our strategies and our thoughts. And, uh, um, and I think the best part though, we just have a really good community with a lot of great traders and we exchange ideas every day. And uh, it's a real, real edge, I believe. Yeah. I've definitely experienced that while being in your room. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, the sort of that split that you have with J trader is really great because you're trading the large caps, he's trading the small caps, and you have slightly different styles, but you're both focused on helping people um, build accounts. So that's really exciting stuff. Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up? Take us all the way back there. Sure. So let's see. I, I grew up in southern Colorado, northern New Mexico for the most part. Um, it was just me and my dad. So it was, it was like, we didn't have much money, but he did, uh, he did provide the things we need. It's just every penny was accounted for. Right. So he did things like he put me on my first motorcycle when I was five years old, I went to my first race and he took me up on the mountain and got me on skis when I was five years old. Um, things like that. Right. But so I, I can't say that we report It's just every dollar was accounted for. Right. So I wasn't, I didn't, I couldn't have a life unless I hustled for my money. You know, I mean, we could, we could, play and we could go snowboarding and things like that. But if I wanted to go on a date or do anything else, I had to go hustle for that money. So, so it kind of taught me early on, you know, that if I wanted to uh, have anything, I had to do something, you know, I had to be some kind of entrepreneur here. So I might did things like, uh, Oh, I played guitar. I was in a band. So people that wanted to learn how to guitar, I just ran an ad in the paper and said, teaching guitar lessons. And I ended up with like 10 people signing up, paying me five bucks an hour. You know, that was my first taste of kind of having my own business. What did your parents think about that? Yeah, my dad always encouraged it, man. He was really good about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, he would, he, he just, he would put the word out there. He just always encouraged it. He made sure that I had the right place to do it. Um, our house was small. We couldn't do it there. So he set me up at his office at one of the office building where he, he ran this place, you know, so we actually had a place to do it, you know, stuff like that. He was very supportive of all that. Um, so it was just kind of a natural progression for me from there. It just, that's all I did was one business after another, you know, I went to, uh, let's see, it was like the summer of 86. Gosh, I'm getting old. Summer of 86. I, uh, I went to work in the oil field, hauling mud to the drilling rigs. And 
I was making like 4,000 a month working hundred hours a week. I made like $4,000 for two or three months in a row. And that was it. I was hooked. Wow. Like, he couldn't get me to go back to school after that. I mean, you know, school is starting and uh, the oil field was busier than ever. I just kept hauling mud. I didn't even go back to school. Really? And it wasn't two months after that. I just, I moved out, got my own place, never looked back. And then that's sort of where, when you became an entrepreneur? I, I did. Yeah. So, I mean, I hauled mud. I went to work on the drilling rigs. Um, you know, I found out, the, you know, the hot shot service. So I started a hot shot service. I bought me a one ton truck. Um, you know, I, I welded it and rigged it up at one of my buddy's house that we used to build sand rails when we were in high school, you know, <laughs> so I bought me a winch truck and I went and just hustled, you know, started hauling stuff out to the oil, to the rigs. And, uh, you know, I did that for a couple of years and just barely made it, you know, I just barely made it during this time I got married. And, and, uh, so it was, you know, I had to, I had to go to work. I couldn't just keep trying that business, you know, anyway, so I had to go back to work for someone else. Um, but then I turned, you know, a couple of years, I saved up some money. I turned around and did it again. And I just, I just kept doing that till like the third time in 96, I started another one and that one stuck. I ended up staying in business for myself all the way up until now from 96. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. And, you know, I think that there's a real connection between entrepreneurs and traders. For sure. For sure. I, I think one of the things that really, it's like, I think we feel undervalued. Like I never, I never found a job where I felt like they valued me. You know, not arrogant, but I mean, valued me as much as I valued myself. I always felt like I could do way more than they could ever give me. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. <laughs> oh, I, I totally 100% agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was always the drive. It's like, you know what? I'll, I'll, I, I, we had kids, you know, we started having kids. I, ended, I have six kids. I raised six kids. I've been married for 30 years. So, I mean, my wife was real supportive through all this. But at the time, you know, I think we had, you know, during that time, we had our fifth kid in 98, right? So I'm two years into my own business. We've got five little ones, um, you know, and it's just hectic. You're, you know you're down to your last buck a lot. And you know, it's just, it's yeah. And was your wife okay with you doing something that was so risky? Sure. Yeah. It was always a struggle, but she was very supportive. You know, she was, she was very supportive. She would just, she, I don't know. She was just good that way. She'd go hit yard sales. You know, she kept all the kids, you know, well clothed and things like that. You know, she just, she was really a uh, frugal, and it didn't take a lot of money. So yeah, it was definitely, she was very helpful through all of it, you know? Um, in fact, when I, you know, I started saving up the money, when I started my own business again in 96, things were going really good. So like, you know, the first year I did, I don't know, 375. And the next year I doubled that. And then the year after that, I doubled that. Right. And so things were just, it was, it was going really well. Um, I could see right away that this time, you know, this was my third business, right? This was my third business. So this time, I wanted to put some of this aside. I wanted to kind of diversify. Um, so that's what really got me into investing. I, I opened an E-Trade account and I, I bought my first stock. Um, but of course, there was no software. It was just the web platform, right? I just bought market order. I bought a thousand shares of a $5.83 oil stock, you know, oil company that actually bought production in this area that we're at. So that's kind of what got me into it. <laughs> so how did you go from working in the oil fields to trading. Isn't that quite a big leap for somebody to take? Right. So, um, over, over the next 10, 15 years, I just kept, you know, I saving money and I just kept investing. So 401k plans and that, that got me into some fun and fundamental analysis and balance sheets. And I was already, I was already into a lot of that anyway, but looking into tech stocks and, uh, you know, after the dot-com bubble, I'd read about some of the things that you know, had happened. And even though I wasn't trading, I was really focused on my business at the time. But I mean, I kind of still had, you know, one foot in the market. But again, it was like, no, there was no charts or nothing. It was just all fundamental analysis, cash balance sheets, things like that, you know, trying to invest in companies that maybe had some legs that could still be around 20 years from now. Um, <clears throat> and so what really got me into trading from that was about, let's see. So in 20, 2013, 2012, the oil field kind of was coming to uh, from a downhill after 2008 had a nice run and things were kind of starting to slow down. And I just didn't want to be in that situation again to where like my whole professional career, 
has revolved around a commodity price, you know? And so the oil price goes down and the bottom starts falling out of the oil field. So I mean, that's what really drove me to do it. I mean, had, I had a pretty good savings that I had, you know, done okay with the investments. Some worked, some didn't, you know, I mean, I had, I had GoPro, I had Fitbit, um, but I also had Amazon. I had some, you know, Nvidia. So, I mean, had some things that worked, but didn't some things that didn't. Um, but anyway, that, that kind of gave me that a little bit of cushion along with what I had saved, you know, from my oil field businesses to where, um, I just thought, man, I've got to do something. And so I looked into day trading, I Googled it and, you know, I kind of went down the path that I hear so many went down lots and lots of chat rooms and trying to learn stuff from other people and, you know, how to, how to day trade this big mystery behind day trading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said that you went straight into working for yourself. Um, did you consider going back to school for finance or anything like that? No, I didn't. I, uh, I did end up by getting a GED, you know, just because at the time everybody was give, harassed me about dropping out of school, you know, <laughs> things were different back then though. I mean, the, the first driver's license I ever had was a class eight, which is now like a CDL. Right. So, I mean, I was like 14 years old. And I had a class eight till I could drive a truck, you know, things were a little bit different back then. So, but that, I don't know, that risk, that risk. So in, in, in 2014, when I started day trading, you know, I just put a couple thousand dollars in an account and just traded small to kind of figure out if this was something I could do, you know, and I went and I, I spent about $15,000 in chat rooms and um, I was in a bunch of, I mean, all the majors, I was in all of them. And the way I always looked at it was, you know, if I could get one piece of one nugget from that room, that was money well spent. So um, that's how I did it. I just went around and found my way until I could kind of incorporate into my own strategy. And how many years did you, do you think you spent going between rooms and trying new strategies? Uh, let's see. Well, I took my first live day trade um, in March of 2014. So I spent, I spent about nine months, almost a year prior to that. Um, I wasn't even trading anything. I was mm -hmm. just going into rooms and, and learning and absorbing everything I could get my hands on. Um, and then I would trade paper trade for, I don't know, a little bit, three months, nine months, you know, just not even with software. Like I hadn't even uh, taken a single trade with software. It was just things like I was still kind of investor minded, you know, I was so it was things like, OK, I'd write it down on a piece of paper saying, OK, I'm long here. And then I would just go on about my day and take a look at it later, you know. So it wasn't really till 2014 that uh, that I started, you know, really spend some time with it where it's like, um, looking into penny stocks and trading penny stocks a little bit. And, you know, it's like, I forget what it was. was uh, G E N E was like my first really good long in January of 2015, you know, up until that, all I had done is shorted penny stocks because to me it made sense fundamentally, you know, I mean, that's, that's all I did. Like 95% of the trades and that I had taken um, up until 2015 were just shorting the penny stocks and all based on dilution and just being on the right side of the trade, you know, of the pollution. Wow. I think that's wild that you remember the name of the stock that you went long on in 2015. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, it was not, it was just, that's all I ever did was short, you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't get long. I wasn't really comfortable long on those penny stocks. Cause I, I just got dumped on like the first, yeah, I don't know, 20 trades I took, you know, were just, uh, I just got dumped on. It's like, man, I'm not touching those things long again, you know? And that's all I did after was short. And so I finally got some success, you know, with the shorting. And you said that you were trading penny stocks. Did you experiment with any of the other markets like Forex or uh, binary options or any of that crazy stuff? I didn't, man. I didn't. I set out to, uh, you know, I set out to just learn a niche and focus on that niche. And that's really, that's how I started out. It was like, I saw the options. I saw the Oh, uh, the futures, you know, and I did a little research on a number of different things, but I decided, you know, I, like, I just, I'm going to focus on one thing. That's it. You know, I had a little success a couple months in after getting dumped on, you know, my first 10 or 20 trades or whatever on the long side, had a little success on the short. And I just decided, you know what, that's it. That's all I'm going to focus on is this one thing. If I can get this one thing right, um, then I'll, you know, add to the playbook. So, you know, as I got some success with it, the struggle that I would have is I would do two or three months 
good trades. And then I would hit, you know, something on the short side, a little too early, get stubborn and then give back, you know, 75% of my month in one trade, you know? And so I struggled with that. I struggled with that for, I don't know, nine months, maybe something like that. Um, and I still ended up green. I mean, I still did okay, but I just, one of the things that really frustrated me about penny stocks is that you just, it just seemed to me that no matter how much I did or no matter how good I got at them, I was always at risk of giving up that big trade. Um, and especially as I started getting some success and, you know, I was trying to size up a little bit. And of course, it, you know, the, the more size I took, you know, the bigger the risk, right? And the bigger the struggle and the bigger the, the loss on the other side, you know? So, you know, I just, I came up with a system that worked for me. Like I, I did things like I call them OTM ads and I get, you know, a starter and I'm only allowed to have one ad. That's it. You know, and it has to work after that, or I, I'm stopping out. Um, I started using hard stops and I started stopping out half with a hard stop. And then, so I, I did a lot of things that really helped improve and I continued to make good money shorting. And, uh, in fact, I really kind of turned it around to where I had I had a really good year, you know, shorting them and kind of overcame giving up those big losses. And and that was all really done with, you know, just for me, it was hard stops. Like I, I would do once I define the system with one out of the money ad. So I'd start in at one level and I'd say, OK, I get one ad and that's it. And then I would start, you know, cover really I'd cover quick to lock in some gains, you know, add back. And so I came up with a setup for for in the money ads where. Once I was in the money, I would cover up and add back, cover up and add back and just keep working this core so that I'm getting paid as the stock went. And that that really turned my those two things just turned my trading around. I quit giving up the big gain, uh, the big losses um, using hard stops, you know, and I just started kind of milking these things for all they were worth. And then I got a taste of a couple of longs. Um, you know, I, I just. Once I got a taste of a couple of longs and using that ITM ads, I just, I got hooked. The thing I like about the long side is, you know, there's no limit to the upside, right? So on a short, of course, we're trying to catch the top before the fade. And on a good day, you get 50% retracement, right? Or on a good day, you get 100% retracement. Um, most days, you know, a 50% retracement. So you, to me, the upside was so limited, even though it was easier to trade, it was easier to nail the entries. But it's the, the upside potential was nowhere near getting on the right side of a long, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's that, that's what lured me to large caps to really start learning them. Because, I mean, if you're looking to long the smaller micro cap stocks, you're going to be longing companies that you have no business being long in. You know, I think that's that's one of the differences. Like I know the large cap stocks like Netflix or Amazon, like they're. You know, these are these are companies that are built well and they're built to last, but the small caps aren't. So how do you how did you um, I guess it makes more sense if you're looking to long or more comfortable longing that you'd be in the large caps. Right. 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 So those. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those two things like fundamentally, I mean, there's a there's a reason I call it smash the bid. Right. Because that's all I did, really. Right. So like f fundamentally, it's just uh, impossible to get long on one of those shorts. I mean, of course, I would try to when I was doing it, I would try to catch the the front side of the move while it's being pumped. Right. But always looking for to get on the right side of the dilution when that's when the dilution started. So it's kind of just uh, you're just I found myself just constantly, you know, eyes bleeding, staring at the tape, trying to find that dilution when I felt like it was hitting. And uh, it was just really stressful trying to get on the long side of these things. So I I was already. You know, uh, I already really like doing the fundamentals, balance sheets, you know, trying to understand companies and especially the, you know, the tech stocks that are growth and not just value, but, you know, growth stocks. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what led me to that. It's like the, in, in short in penny stock land, it's like to me, the way I see it is like the natural flow of everything is like gravity, right? Just pulls those things down. <laughs> if you just put them out there and don't touch them, they're just going to go down, right? And large cap stocks are kind of the other way around. If they're a solid company, it's just people are always buying them. And so the natural flow is just kind of to the upside. So you, I felt like if I'm going to really get good at the long game, I needed to get in, you know, understand large caps better instead of fighting, the, you know, get on the trend side instead of fighting the trend, right? So the previous guests that we've had on all are specialists in 
shorting these like piggies, what we like to call uh, these like small to micro cap stocks that are have very poor fundamentals. And you pointed something out that really stands out in my mind. It's that the upside has unlimited potential and the, the downside doesn't. Well, so like, let's take NVIDIA for, for example, right? So um, I, I hold NVIDIA in my long-term account. So, I mean, it's gone from, I think my, my first initial buy was like 1683 and it's at, you know, 275 today, right? So, I mean, where does it stop? I, you know, I don't know. I, I think it has the potential to be maybe at 500, you know, it still has a big runway. Um, you know, you look at Amazon and I think I, I have to look, it's like 580 bucks or something is what I got some Amazon for right around the same time as I got NVIDIA. And uh, I mean, look at it now. So where does it stop? I don't know. You know, there's just the, the upside is, is unlimited. Like it can just go, but if you're going to short a penny stock or if you're going to short a stock, you know, even if, let's say if I got short NVIDIA right now, the absolute best it could do is go to zero and that's $275, right? The upside is just unlimited. Yeah, I, I can definitely see the benefit there. Um, okay, so maybe we can talk about sizing up an account, you know, growing an account. Yeah, sure, sure. So I think just to kind of, I don't know, to preface that, like, I think one of the things that, like one of the misconceptions is, you know, when you're trading small caps, right, you just want to get on the right side of dilution, right? You want to, you, you want to be on the right side of the trade and large caps are the same way. Um, I don't see it as competition. I see it more as like, I just want to be on the right side, just like whoever's diluting and selling shares into those small caps. You know, you just want to be on the right side of the trade. So the level two tells a story, right? The level three, the, the tape reading, it tells a story and we just got to figure out what that story is. And large caps isn't any different. In, in fact, to me, it's easier to tell the story because there's not any one person that can manipulate or send most of these stocks in the direction that they want, right? It's a consensus. There's a, it has to be the majority of people trading it that day that agree on something. And so what, what some see as competition, I kind of see as, is, you know, whatever is my friends. I want to be on the right side of what the general consensus is. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are on the wrong side of the general consensus, they, as soon as they figure out they're on the wrong side, me included, you know, we're all in a hurry to get back on the right side of it. And so it has a tendency to make things trend in the same direction, right? Cause there's a lot more uh, people interested in it. So as far as up goes, the, the biggest, like I, I learned pretty quick as I had built my account to a point to where I really wanted to start getting some size. I figured out for me, you know, a hundred thousand is a three dollar stock would was stress me out. I'd much rather have uh, a thousand shares of a three hundred dollar stock. There's just not near the risk. So I mean, I could get ten. I know I have to get ten dollars out of a uh, a three hundred dollar stock, right, to get the same move or to get the same gain. But to me, it was much more comfortable to get. Ten dollars out of a three hundred dollar stock than it was to even get ten cents out of a three dollar stock with a hundred thousand shares, right? Because it could, a three hundred dollar stock could dump a dollar, and I could get out, and or you know, and if a three dollar stock dumps ten cents, right? I'm out. I'm already, I'm already down ten grand, you know. So um, it was just for me, it was a whole lot more comfortable to be in something like that. And so that's what got me really, really trading Netflix a lot, um, just large caps in general. The last couple of years. Uh, I was just, I just lean more and more towards them. And uh, this year, Netflix has just been one of my favorites. It reminds me of a low float, the way it trades. Mm -hmm. So I just fell in love with it quick. Mm -hmm. So maybe take us through an example. How would using options instead of shares be different inside of a strategy? So, I mean, if uh, most options on these, like Netflix, for instance, is a good one to use it as an example. I mean, it's going to have two or 300 contracts on either side of the bid and offer on most strikes. And so if you really want to take some size on Netflix and, you know, let's say it sets up for a long, um, you can take a thousand shares of the stock. You can take a hundred contracts at, uh, of uh, some calls, a hundred contracts calls in the, at one strike and a hundred contracts of another call on another strike. Um, you know, and then it, when it goes in your favor, you can, you can actually roll out of those. You can, you know, there's just so many things that you can do. You, if you're just long the stock, you can't be long and short at the same time. So, I mean, 
how many times have you been in a in a short a stock and it's falling apart and your your bank and it's coming down into this daily support and you don't know if it's going to keep going or if it you know you you know it's going to bounce but it might just bounce a little and keep going and fade all day it might just bounce but with options i can go ahead and get short there too i could go ahead and cover up my you know my my puts or whatever i could sell my puts there uh you know, buy another strike. I could buy some calls there. So you can be long and short the stock at the same time, you know, and that's, to me, that's one of the big advantages. Like I, I'll be, uh, I'll be long a stock and it comes like today on NVIDIA, it comes up to 275. You know, you can grab some puts, like 270 puts and you can work that three, four, five dollar fade if you think it's going to pull back to 270 and still be long, right? I still own the calls. I still have my calls that I'm holding for the week because I think it can hit 290 by the end of the week, right? But I think I can get a $5 move out of this rejection of 275. I can grab some puts and play the downside while my upside just keeps on working for me. And you just can't do that with stock. Yeah, it seems like there's certain parts of it, like the risk management or the scaling up part, like you just mentioned, that are beneficial uh, over just trading shares. So how did you learn about options and then what was the transition like for you? Um, well, so I've been really, st I've been studying options for a couple of years. I, I, I kind of figured out, man, you know, a couple of years ago that they just seemed really complicated to me and all the resources that I had found, they were pretty complicated and they, they can be. So it took me a little while to figure out how to dumb them down because I didn't, I don't, I didn't really want to be complicated. I like things that are simple, you know, so I'm like my charts have like a, a 200 and a 20 moving average on them. You know, that's it. I don't have a bunch of indicators. And um, so I like to keep things simple. So it took me a little while to, to really research and to figure out, okay, well, how can I dumb these things down for myself? And then I just started trading them with my stock. So I just got in them only on my positions that I was already in and, and it's worked my way up from there, you know, and you find things that work and you go from there. So like I'm, I was long Netflix from in February from that dip when the market crashed at 239 is where I started in long. Well, I bought calls right there too when I got long the stock. And so I just practiced with that, you know, I, I worked those calls all the way up. So I didn't start off being long and short of stock, right? I just started off, okay, let's just, let's just see if I can use these options, buy some calls to get long, buy some puts to get short. That's simple. And, and really, this is how I still follow it. I do have some more complicated strategies now, but that's after trading them for a couple of years. And, and even those are just, they're just long-term kind of swing trading, you know, swing trading setups. So for the most part, I'm just buying calls to go long and buying puts to go short. Um, so a lot of traders are probably listening to this and thinking, okay, well, you know, in, in order to trade options, you need option, need to know option strategies. And there's, um, and a lot of people think it's, it's something that's not very accessible to them. So you would be able to transfer your strategy over into options fairly easily. Right. Right. And that's, I mean, really that's the coolest thing about them is, uh, I mean, everything that you've learned, everything that you know, anybody about trading stocks, you just, it carries over. You just bring it with you. There's just a few extra things that you're going to want to learn about options so that you don't get burned, you know? Um, and it's, it's like risk, like for the risk management part, there's, there's a way that I teach people to, to trade when you're starting out. And even after you understand them, this is one of my strategies. It's just you, your risk is capped, right? So if you want to risk a thousand dollars per trade, you buy a thousand dollars worth of options, right? That's it. You, you never get dumped on again. No matter what happens, you can't lose more than a thousand bucks. So you've capped your risk. And if you're right and you manage to trade right, and you know, like, like I caught Netflix at 239 on that bounce back in February. Um, if I was wrong, you know, I lost $2,000 worth of options that I bought. That's it. And if I was right, like, and I was, it bounced and it ripped, you know, I turned that into about a $60,000 trade. So the upside is unreal, wow. and but you cap your risk. Uh, you've had like some incredible success trading these options. Would you say that that's the, the most valuable part is being able to just set it and forget it because you can set your risk right at, right at the outset of buying or, or selling the option? Right, it is, yes. That's one of, the, one of the biggest advantages is 
you know, you, you've, you've, you've guaranteed what you're willing to risk. That's all you put on. Right. And so you've, you can manage your account so, so much more uh, emotionless. I mean, you know, it takes the, it, it just takes a lot. If you can take a lot of discretion out of it, like, what am I going to do? Well, it's either going to work and then I have to worry about, okay, how am I going to manage this trade in the money? Right. Or if it goes against me, I don't have to manage it. I don't have to put a stop in place. I don't have to do anything because I know going in that I was willing to risk this. Right. That I was willing to I was willing to risk it going in. And so I, I call, you know, one R like it's whatever your risk per trade is. Right. So if you have a one hundred dollar risk per trade, you buy one hundred dollars worth of options. If you're wrong, you lost one R. Um, if you're right and it goes in your favor, it could go, you know, options. I've I've had a sixteen hundred percent gain in options. I've had over 2000% gain in options, mm. you know, and I've seen where they can go 10,000. I mean, that's not normal. I mean, it's not easy to catch a 10,000 or even a, a 1000, but to catch a 100, 300% gain. Yeah. On, on a daily basis. And then, you know, sometimes we're in the right place at the right time or, or we use the, the, the trade management part of the system uh, in the money ads and stuff that I use for my system. It keeps me in the trade, you know, working a core, it, it keeps me in the trade. It helps me to milk, you know, the upside for as much as I can possibly milk out of it. You know? And so, and, and another thing too, that's really valuable about this is and I, I went down this rabbit hole too, you know, starting out and I had a small account. I just, I wasn't willing to risk a lot. I started off with just a small account. Um, I learned real quick about the PDT rule, you know, so I, I would just, I wanted to put, money and I put money in my account so I could get around the PDT rule. Right. But when I first started out, I mean, that's what I did. I had to fight the PDT rule and I was like, well, let's just do the sure trader thing. And so I went that route and I've, you know, I, I went down those roads and I was like, that's it. I'm just going to put some money in this account and keep it up over there. Right. So the thing about options is they, they settle, the funds settle T plus one. So there's no more PDT rule. I mean, you can open a cash account with 500 bucks or two whatever your broker allows you to do right and it's a cash account there is no pdt rule all right you can trade as many times as you want until you run out of cash so if you have two thousand dollars sitting in there and you buy you know, five hundred dollars worth of options each time you can take four trades that day if you buy a hundred dollars worth of options you can take 20 trades that day right you can just you can trade until you run out of cash and then the funds settle overnight wow and what about the commissions or the fees and that type of thing is it is it more advantageous than trading stocks? The commissions are a little bit higher. And when you're trading small one or two contracts, you know, you can get set up to where you're just per contract basis. And so your, your commissions are smaller. Um, you know, as you trade bigger lots and all that stuff, it makes sense to have just a cost per trade, you know? Um, so all brokers are different. You're going to pay, you're going to pay a little bit in commissions, just more than you did with stocks but it doesn't even compare to the borrow fees that I used to have shortened pigs. Like it doesn't even compare wow. thousands of dollars in locate fees and gone. I, I have zero locate fees. That's one of my goals this year. Not a dollar. I have not spent a dime on locate fees this year. So yeah, that's pretty impressive because that's one of the, the biggest problems right now for small micro cap traders. Um, yeah. It's a tough one, right? And not having the borrows. Yeah. And not having the borrows is, can be so annoying. Right. That's one of the worst things I hated about it was the best setup, nice stock, you know, ripping. And then I just couldn't get borrows. It's just enough to drive you nuts. It's like, I've, there's got to be a better way. Okay. So let's talk about technical analysis. What has your journey been like? Uh, what things work for you and what things don't work for you? Sure. Yeah. So I think one of the things I found early on, if I lean on something a lot, then it, I would use it as a crutch, you know? So things like RSI, indicators like RSI, sure, like pulling them up on the, on the daily chart to kind of give you an idea of how something is kind of made sense. Um, implied volatility, I still have on a daily chart. You know, that kind of makes sense to me. But to, to help me decide whether I think something's going to work or not, or whether it's going to be a big breakout or a small breakout or, you know, things like that, it just, I found myself when I, I would use them as a crutch. And so I just, I pretty much wiped all that stuff out a long time ago and just said, you know what, I'm not, I have nothing on my charts, support and resistance lines. That's it. Um, small caps, I would use the VWAP and sort support and resistance. That's it. And then I've added a couple of things going down 
the road here to large caps to just kind of help me see when a trend breaks or when a trend starts where it could be a reversal. So I just didn't, I, I didn't like, like I've done some, some resources. Like um, I, I do love trade station the way it has uh, the level three. So I have, you know, full market depth on 11 or 13 different exchanges and ECN books, right? Not exchanges, but ECN books. So have this full market depth with volume profile per price and volume profile, you know, time, all those are really good tools. They are. It just, uh, you know, to use them as a crutch you, I, for me, I just had to be careful because I would do that. I would just start looking for Like I would see something that I really thought was going to do something. And I would be looking on one of those crutch tools for a confirmation. Mm. And then by the time you get the confirmation, you find out you're right. And it was too late, you know, or you're right. And you gave up, partial gains because of it right yeah that's really interesting i like that you call it a crutch because a lot of these indicators that people use are um what they call lagging indicators versus leading indicators like the the volume tools that you that you use or that you mentioned um so i, th I think that's that's a really interesting distinction is something people should really take into account um so uh inside of these large cap stocks um, how do you grow conviction in that trade? Do you use fun fundamental analysis as well? Well, not really for intraday decisions, but yes. So, like let's take, let's take Nvidia for example, right? So this they just had QT uh, Q2 earnings. So I've been all over this company, and I know their financials, and I know their growth, the runway that they have for growth, right? So I have a really strong fundamental knowledge and belief in this company, right? I've watched them grow um, ex exponentially. And so I have this fundamental bias behind it. So yes, absolutely. When they sell off after QT earnings, um, you know, I'm just, it's just, to me, it was a gift. I was just looking for a place to get in on that. So yeah, I mean, the fundamentals behind that, that's what gave me that conviction. So, you know, the dip to whatever it was, 239, 234, whatever it was right in there, um, right after earnings, you know, that's where I started loading up. And that conviction came from the fact that even if it did, you know, go down some more there, I have a really strong conviction that it was going to continue up because of the fundamentals behind the company. So yeah, that, that adds a lot of conviction. Okay. So let's touch a little bit on psychology and that world. Uh, when it comes to trading large cap stocks, I mean, you're swinging these stocks sometimes for like multiple days. Uh, ideally, you're holding and working a core position, you know, until the stock reaches like like Amazon stature. Uh, so what what does it take in terms of psychology? So I think I, I think I call it like train your brain, right? You got to train your brain. So, you know, discipline comes with this. Um, so how do I, how do I say this? What, what's the best way to say this? So if, if you're trading your hopes and your dreams, it's, it's going to be really hard to hold for multiple days, right? Because you, you get up and this is one of the things that I know beginner traders do. I did it. You know, you get up and you're green and you can't wait to take those profits. Um, and then when you're red, you kind of want to hold on to them because you don't want to realize those losses. Right? So we've got to train your brain and to do that, you, you want it to be automatic. It's like driving a car, right? When someone slams on the brakes in front of you, you don't have to tell your foot, you know, foot, hit the brake, right? You just hit the brake. You know, it does it automatically. And the goal is to get there in trading, right? That's the goal. If you can get to where things are automatic, um, but you've, to do that, you've got to train your brain. How do you do that? You've got to do the right things over and over and over and over again until it becomes automatic, right? But, but you've got to be doing the right things. So like if... You know, when your setup presents itself, you know, when you see that setup and it's there, if you don't pull the trigger and take that trade, you're lying to your brain. Like you're telling your brain, okay, this isn't an ideal setup. And so you've just undone everything that you've been trying to do, right? So when that sets up, you have to take the trade over and over and over again. When, you know, so, so that to connect that into discipline, right? So it's the same with discipline. When you set a stop loss, so you get in a trade, whatever your system is, you get in a trade and immediately you have a, a max loss stop you know, set or profit target or however you manage your trade, right? The minute that you take the trade and you get into those things, 
you have to do that every time. If you take that stop loss and you say, oh, I'm going to move it. Maybe it wasn't in the right place. I mean, you're just lying to yourself and now you've set yourself back, right? So if you're going to train your brain to do things automatically, um, you have to do the right things over and over and over again, and it becomes automatic. And so then that, that just adds to everything, right? That adds to discipline. So our jobs as traders, in my opinion, is to extract money from the market every day. That's it. That's my job, right? So I come in in the morning and this is where I get, you know, this, and I'm, this is where I get some of the discipline from, right? It's just, I want to extract money. So I come in, I a setup presents itself. I take it. I work the system. How, how do I, what are my targets? When am I going to get out of a trade? Am I working a core? Am I using profit stops? What is my, what is my management on this trade? And I stick to it and I follow it and I follow it and I follow it. I get to a place to where I've guaranteed a green day. I'm done clicking buttons. That's it. And so for me, like you were asking discipline to work a core from like Netflix in February from 239 to 421 right before earnings. I had a position in that stock the whole way up, right? So that's the discipline in that is to do the same things over and over and over again. So I like to work when I work that core, I'm taking profits at highs and I'm always going to be mindful of where my average is if I take an ad, right? So I'm gonna, I want to be able to add those shares back that I sold, but not at the expense of my average, right? That average is you got to keep that average low enough under key levels so you don't take yourself out of the trade. And so that whole ride all the way from 239 to 421 before earnings, there was two places that I got taken completely out. And you can see them on a daily chart when it just fell apart, it hit my average, right? Because I'm in stop break even basically on what's left and so if you manage your average correctly and you manage your ads correctly you know there's you, you never get taken out of the trade and so that's where the discipline comes in that's where the train your brain comes in right you just do the same things over and over and over again and if you're doing the right things and you're being taught the right things um you just do them over and over and over again it becomes automatic and then it takes the luck out you know i don't i don't feel like i got lucky i mean how did i catch tesla's earnings um you know, how did I catch anyway? I, I don't, I don't feel like it's luck. There's no luck anymore. I just take the setup. I take the thing over and over and over again. And when it doesn't work, I lose one R or two R, or, you know, whatever I've decided to take the trade for. And, and if it works, I work the system again and I manage that trade all the way up until I get that exit signal, that final exit signal. Yeah. That's really impressive that you have the level of discipline to do that and sticking to your to your process. And I know that, you know, you have, you have a, a statistical edge in the market because of your trading strategy, but that will only work if your sample size is big enough, right? It, like you said, if you start taking it over and over again. Um, and then you're talking about, you're talking about, you know, working a core and managing an average. And one of the questions that we got from the community was, once you're in a trade, how do you manage targets? And I think that's what they're asking. It's like, how do you start, how do you go about taking profits uh, inside of the, one of these like multi-week trades uh, where you're working a core? Sure, so it, it's, it's about the big picture, okay? There's, I have different trade management, different exit strategies. So, you know, it's gonna depend on what kind of trade it was going in, right? So if if I'm playing off the monthly time frame, like if you pull up a monthly chart on Nvidia, why was I long at you know 234 after earnings, right? Why did why was I so interested in, in being long there, and why am I so interested in staying long until 300? You know, so take a peek at the monthly chart. It tells a story. I got in at the bottom of um, when it's about to touch a moving average, right? So look at the nine EMA on the monthly on NVIDIA. It's about to hit that. It, NVIDIA loves the nine EMA on the monthly. Every time it hits the nine EMA on the monthly, it's it has the next month candle is the biggest candle it's had, you know, for the last three months, right? So it tells a story. If I'm taking that trade, um, I it is very important to me to work a core until it's broke new highs, until it sets up the biggest monthly candle like the last time it hit the nine EMA. Okay. And if I sell myself short, if I don't work that position all the way up, you know, I have sold myself short. And to me, that's kind of like the discipline, right? It's like, I want to do the same things over and over again. So I got in this trade with a long thesis of 
you know, 290 to 300. I believe it once it gets past all time highs, you know, it's going to see that mark of 280, 290, 300, somewhere in there, right? So that's the, the whole goal is no matter what, like if you take profits, you know, say it, it went and hit 250 and you take profits there. I'm always looking to add back. I want my original size back, but not at the expense of my average. That's what matters, right? And the big picture is what matters. So let's go back and let's say, so for the NVIDIA, I have to be really mindful of that average. It has to pull back to a certain number before I can add those cells back mm. because I'm not going to sacrifice my average because I'm in this for the big picture. Does that make sense? So I'm. Oh, it totally does. Do you find that you're okay. taking those targets because it's a great place um, to take a piece off and still maintain that average? Or do you have more, more technical targets? So the, a lot of that will be price action. A lot of that will be, you know, support, key support levels, um, you know, things like that. Absolutely. You know, so if you have, you know, like right now we have blue skies, right? So where do you, there's no resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing but tape. That's all you have now. We're, we're at all time highs on NVIDIA today, right? So there's nothing to, but tape to look at. Um, but if once you're, when you're inside that range, yeah, sure. Daily candles, every time you hit a high on a daily candle, weekly candles, monthly candles, you know, mm -hmm. um, those are going to be good spots to, to take some profit, you know? Man, you know, this sounds a lot like uh, videos that I recently watched um, from Seven Points Capital and, you know, only getting out of a trade when you have a real reason to. Um, and I know you're friends with uh, Mike Katz. Um, do you guys talk about that type of stuff? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's uh, and he's the guy I call when I have a bad day. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a good dude, great trader. And I've learned so much from him. Absolutely. Yeah. And to be able to work that core, I mean, it's tough. It's tough. And he. He has a way of doing it too that, uh, and I like to pick his brain. I, I love it. I mean, I, I still do. I'm always learning, always learning. Um, the next piece that I wanted to talk about is you mentioned uh, risk management a little bit. So let's dive a little bit more into risk management. Uh, I always love covering this topic because I find that different traders have different perspectives on maybe the same methods. So you, you mentioned an R. Maybe you want to explain to people what an R means. Sure. So the way I, the way I see the R is risk per trade. So this is how I view risk and this is how I manage risk. It's, it's not, it's per trade. Okay. So you can divine that however you want. I mean, if you have a small account, um, you know, say a $5,000 account, 1% uh, of your account is $50, right? That could be your risk per trade. That would be a very realistic risk per trade. A um, hundred dollars per trade right? That would give you a 2% of your account. So what does that mean? That means, well, I don't know, you've got, you know, 50 trades before you're out of the game, right? So to me, it's like, you, you've got to find that risk. You have to define that risk per trade, right? And that's how I, that's what I use to manage. So when I say one R for me, it's like, you know, wherever my risk per trade is right now, if I'm at $2,000 risk per trade, then that's one R. $2,000 is one R for me. A um, hundred dollars risk per trade for someone else would be that would be one R would be a hundred dollar risk per trade for them. So it just it's a it's a relative way to describe risk because it's different for all of us, right? I mean, if 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 I could risk five thousand dollars in a trade, and I can and it could be less than one percent of my account, right? That's not the same as someone that has a five thousand dollar account and he's going to put five thousand dollars into a trade, right? Hmm. That's just so that's that's how what I used to refer to it so that everybody, it you know. You can just relate to it. It's one R. It's one, whatever your risk per trade is. Do you have any tips for people that have a small account that are looking to build their account? Well, sure. If you're, if you're starting out, the name of the game is survival, right? So you want to be able to trade as many times as you can. You want to be able to train your brain. That's why the PDT rule is just the dumbest thing that this, it's yeah. absolutely the dumbest rule ever. It's, it's a hindrance and it tra oh, ch changes people's psychology, right? There's so many people that are stuck in that right now uh, and they go off and they, they go to, you know, to, to open accounts in different countries where it's not as safe to put their money. I think it's really a terrible rule. Right, right. And it's such a hindrance. It is. So, I mean, my, my advice to, um, well, my advice to anybody starting out is to come get in my room, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> but sure. other than that, 
<laughs> but seriously, if if you get in options and you trade options and you understand that just to buy a call to go long, so you, you buy to open, you're going to buy a call when you want to go long and you're going to sell to close when you want to sell it. And then a put, you just buy to open a put and sell to close it when you want to sell it to go short, right? So if you do that with a with a small account, um, you get it options, you know, option level two approval enabled with a cash account. There's no PDT rule and your money's in there the next day. So, I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the hugest, it's, it's just a huge advantage. And once you understand and you see options and you really understand how they work and how liquid they are with, with large cap stocks, um, it's like trading penny stocks, but they move liquid, very, very smooth and liquid, like the underlying stock yeah. does. So I mean, you showed me, um, you, you actually grabbed an options contract from the options chain and you pasted it into a, you know, the, the chart window and it opened up a chart for that specific contract inside of the larger underlying um, instrument. And that was really cool because it looked like a low float, you know, penny stock that had exploded, but it's just the price of the option itself, you know, one of many options inside of this chain being tracked. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it, and w once you understand how they work, once you get a taste of it, once you see how these things really move, um, I just think it's a huge edge. I mean, you, there, there, I'm not, I'm not going to bag on penny stocks or penny stock traders because it's a great niche and there's a lot of money to be had. Right. So I don't want anybody to take this wrong. I'm not bagging on anybody. But I am saying that once you understand how the penny stocks trade and how well large caps follow the rules, um, how much more fluid they move, uh, resistance and support levels and how they bounce. And anyway, once, once you really get that and you see how these options trade off of the underlying, it's like having an AWX to go long on every day. Let's talk about finding a strategy that works. Um, and then tracking the, that strategy in the right way to find that statistical edge. Um, if you had to tell somebody how to go about doing that from the beginning, uh, what would you tell them? Okay, so I think that's one of the hardest things, you know, starting out as a trader, right, is to just find out what works for you because we're all different personalities. You know, some some take way more risk than others. Uh, I've worked with people that, you know, it's like it took them – six months to save up that $2,000 account, right? They don't want to risk anything. So how do you, how do you help them as they try to find the setups that work for them? Well, I think that's one of the things where it, the advantages of having someone that has setups that work, right? If you can have some defined setups, at least, you know, you're working on the right stuff. And, and that's why I, I really believe in some type of education, you know, mm -hmm. to, to really find something. So someone can say, you know, here's a list of 15 setups that I know work for me, right? So I have, I'm, I'm giving you something to work with or, you know, other rooms. I'm not just saying me in general. I'm just saying you need, you know, something that you know works. If you're trying to figure out what works for you and you don't know if it's you or if it's the setup, I mean, how are you ever going to get anywhere, right? You're just going to keep losing. Yeah. And at least if, at least if you have some help, you know that this is a valid setup, you know, the rules of engagement, you know, that this works. And so now the question is, does it work for me, right? You just got to figure out, is this work for me? Is it part of my personality? So I think that's really important to have some good, you know, guidelines of things that you know work. And then you got to stay in the game. I, you know, that's why I say like a $100 risk per trade. And that's why I really recommend options because you can't get dumped on. You can't get stubborn. If you go and buy a $100 put on a stock and it rips, you're only going to lose a hundred bucks. Now, if you break rules and add or something, you know, you could lose more, right? But that one R, you're going to lose that one R. That's it. And so, if for the first, you know, year, or six months, nine months, a year, if you're doing all the right things and you you have a, you know, good valid setups to work on, all you know that okay, it's just me. Like I didn't make money on this trade. What what's wrong? Well, you know, it's just you. You you've got to look at your entries. You've got to look at your exits. Was it was it a bad entry or was it a bad exit? You know, how did I manage the trade? If you don't have that guidance, then it's just going to take more time, right? It's going to take more time. You're going to, you're going to have to figure out, is it you or is it the setup, you know? So I think that's one of the big advantages of just any 
you know, good trading education that's going to help you get there. Um, but I think options, the big advantage to that is you can cap your risk. Like you just, you can't get dumped on. And so when I say, if you have a $5,000 account and I say, okay, I think a hundred dollar risk per trade is probably realistic f for you. You know, you know that you've got 50 trades until you're broke, right? Mm -hmm. So, or 45 trades until you have to refund. And so now we have something we can, you can take that setup and you can, you know, work it. I could give you five setups and say, look, just focus on these five and let's track this and see, you know, and if we evaluate them and look at them and say, Hey, um, is this part of your personality? Is it, you know, what's really going on here? So there's just so much to trading. It's really, I don't, it's really hard to just go out there. Like I, I, I can't say it enough. And it's, I learned something from everybody. Every room that I was in, I learned something. Um, I learned their setups. I learned their, you know, I've got some kind of nugget out of everything. I, I just can't imagine trying to do this on my own. I probably would have been running around for five or six years before I got anywhere. You know, yeah, and, and people eventually would want to get to that level, like like you are, where you're you're trading multiple accounts and you're you're creating like this consistent wealth for like you and your family, and but you're also building this community um, where you coach traders to trade the way you do and to use the setups that you know are statistically proven to be uh, profitable. Um, so what's it like, um, you know, being coached by you? Um, so I like to, I like to help people define, you got to define your risk profile. First of all, we got to figure out, you know, wh what your goals are and what you're willing to risk. So, um, you know, like I have one person that's a doctor that he just swing trades, right? And he's got a huge account. And that's a whole different story than another guy that has a $2,000 account. And he, it took him literally six months to save that, right? That's com two completely different people. So there's no two accounts that are the same, just like there's no two people that are the same. And then, and what are your goals, right? What are your goals? One guy, his, his goals are just survival. The other guy is like, he's willing to risk some money. Like you know, he'll put a lot on the line because he doesn't need the money. He's got more money than he needs, right? So that's what, that's what I do. I just try to help people find themselves, find and develop a risk profile that works for them because everybody's different. And, you know, and, and just focus on building that account based on that profile, right? And so that's it. If you're new, it just try, the main goal is to be doing and practicing the right things and learning discipline and training yourself. And, you know, and I, and I, and I do that. That's one of the things that I do is I like to set up a specific uh, set of setups that I think will work for someone, you know, if someone's working full time and they're just trading swing trading, then these setups right here work better and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. If someone has the time to be at the screens every morning at the open, I have some setups that work really well at the open. So we'll use those for this guy, that, that kind of stuff. So um, I have, you know, I have 26 valid setups that I've proven work and they work really well and I love them. And then, you know, I have another eight on top of that that are um, my A-list, you know. How do you know that they work? Did you, did you, uh, do you have like some crazy spreadsheet somewhere where you're like keeping track of everything? Um, I, I did use Excel for a long time. I found TraderView to be a really good tool. So I use TraderView now. I like it. It's quick. It's easy. I don't have to... Uh, I just do a dump, you know, just pull it from my trade station stuff and dump it in there. E-Trade the same way. And I can put multiple accounts into it without a lot of work. And it has a lot of tools for searching and you can tag it and so forth. So, yeah, that, I use that tool and I, I really recommend it to um, people that I am coaching. I recommend it to them so I can I'm, I can be their mentor. I can go in and look at their trades and there's no additional work that's involved with that. You know, they can just say, Hey, um, take a look at this trade for me, would you? And then I also set them up as like, they're my mentor. So they can go in and look at my trades. They can look at my charts and my executions and stuff. So it's a really, really powerful tool. It's been really, um, well received. I like it. Okay. So if, if you had to define what your edge in the market is, um, how would you do that? I'm going to give you a little bit of time <laughs> to kind of put that together. To find my edge would just be uh, repetition experience. I mean, I, I just, I stand by it. It's a hundred percent is this job is very, very difficult and it's very emotional. The more you can do to take emotions out of the trade, uh, the better off you're going to be. 
So, and I think that's, that's my edge. And it kind of always has been one of my edges is the ability to detach emotion from money. And, you know, that's different for everybody. So I, I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to do that for someone that has taken them six months to save $2,000. You know, I don't know how to help them get there um, other than explaining to them that if you can't get there, you're probably in the wrong business. If you can't get to where you can't detach yourself emotionally from your money, you should probably just focus on uh, ticker symbol J O B. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause this is a risky business, you know? Um, so, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I think experience is the edge. You know, I think that that's my edge and mm -hmm. the ability to take emotions out. It's, it's important. You've, you've got to take that trade, right? You, you have to pull the trigger. You have to do it over and over again. That's the only way you're going to train your brain. And every time that you don't, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to your brain. You're telling it that that's not a valid setup. And so it doesn't going to recognize it as a valid setup if you don't take the trade, you know? So I think that's my edge is the ability to recognize that early on. I get asked that a lot, you know, how did I get profitable? Mm -hmm. And to some people, it seems like it was quick, but I mean, there's a lot of screen time, man. A lot of screen time. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily quick, but I think that's key. You know, you, you have to train your brain. And the only way to do that is you've got to pull the trigger. You have to take the same setup over and over again, you know? And that's an edge. When you learn how to do that, that's a huge edge because you'll get there quick. Absolutely. And spending time in your room and looking at your materials and, you know, what you teach people and how you teach people. Um, I think that edge is that solid risk management that you practice, you know, that solid trade conviction and consistency. Um, and then it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter, you know, you know, when, where you choose to enter on the chart, if you manage your risk properly and you're consistent about it, you're going to find out very quickly whether it's something that works or doesn't. So we are kind of our worst enemy when it comes to trading, I find. Absolutely. Well said. Okay. So if you had to do it all over again to become a successful, profitable trader, uh, you know, what's the path of least resistance? How would you go about doing that? All right. So I, I think one of the most valuable lessons I have learned the, the power of one, just one ticker. That's all it takes is one ticker, um, one good trade. If I could do it all over again, I would just go back, open up a hundred thousand dollar account and just trade Netflix. That's it. Thousand dollar, you know, thousand shares on each side, um, ten dollars average a day, low risk. You know, you can just make it make it work. Um, the the thing is, if you watch one ticker over and over and over, it, you get this the same setups that you see in other tickers. You get that setup, and you're like, okay, this is a really high probability setup. And you track it for a while, and you find out that hey, that setup is really high probability across any ticker. Okay, and then you use that same setup in Netflix, and you trade it for a year, and you find out you have a 91% win rate with that setup on Netflix tell me that's not an edge, right? I mean, that's a huge edge. So when I see that setup, I take it and I take it hard. I load the boat, right? And if it was any other ticker, it's a 70%, maybe a 69% winner, right? So I just won't have that kind of conviction. So one of the biggest, in my opinion, one of the biggest lures of penny stocks and you know, Google search for day trading, you know, leads us down these rabbit holes that the best money is to be made chasing penny stocks. And it's just not true. It's just not true. The best money to be made and it's scalable is trading options on uh, a high price ticker like Netflix. And it doesn't have to be Netflix, but it's just one of my favorites. My point is it's scalable. I can scale this to millions and millions of dollars. There's no end to what you can scale to. And then when you're small, you can trade it just like you did a penny stock. So, I mean, if I could do it all over again, that's what I do. I wouldn't even waste my time looking at anything else. I would start from day one. I would just trade Netflix and I would just trade these two setups on it. That's it. That's all I would do every day. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, the, the path that you took and the, the things you did wrong probably also affected you know, who you are and how good of a trader you are today, just as much as the things you did right. Um, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that is a good point. 
you know, if I, I want to transfer my trading knowledge from trading small to micro cap stocks and my background in futures, I think that could transfer well over into the type of trading that you guys do. Um, so if I were to start from like ground zero, what's the first thing I need to learn um, in order to understand that type of trading? Okay, so so pick your your favorite setups, you know, maybe your top four, or your top eight or whatever, right? And then pick four tickers and look for those setups. In fact, you can go back and back test them, you know, if you're a back test guy, right? But at least go back and look at those charts. So, you know, I, I don't know, Amazon, a Google, a Netflix, and NVIDIA maybe, or, you know, something to that effect. And just pull up those charts and go back and find your setups, right? Because uh, you, you've already found profitability. You've already found some consistency, right? You're already where you want to be. Now you're just scaling, right? So I think you'd be surprised at just how well your setups that you already trade right now work in large caps. Um, and you, you mentioned uh, one, you know, one good trade. And, you know, Mike, Mike uh, Bellafiore's book comes to mind, that one good trade. He also has the uh, the playbook. Uh, have those books at, at all influenced you? Right. Yeah. That whole uh, SMB Capital and Mike Belfort trading in the zone is another good one. But yeah, absolutely. That's quite the resource. Uh, Seven Points Capital is another one. They've got some great videos, uh, recaps, and other ones. Both of them. Those are all really good resources. Smash! It's been a blast talking with you. We've learned a lot. Um, and it's really exciting that people have access um, and I actually want them to go over to uh, smashthebit.com. I think there's a wealth of knowledge there that um, a lot of traders need in order to get to that next level. Um, so I want to thank you for joining me on the show and I hope we can catch up again very soon. All right. Thanks, Dale. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. And I just want to say that I really enjoy your podcast. Um, keep up the good work, man. It's, it's quite the resource right here. And uh, I really enjoy listening to it. So keep it up, man. And so that was just a killer interview with Smash the Bid. If you want to find him and follow him, he's on Twitter at Smash the Bid. Um, and you can also find him at SmashTheBid.com as part of his trading community. Now, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Dell the Trader. You can also find us in a whole bunch of different podcast services. You can head over to activetraders.chat where you can see the article and the resource links uh, and all of the show notes. And activetraders.chat is actually a community where I screen share, trade live every day with members, and we teach market auction theory, uh, volume analysis, and advanced order flow analysis. And if you have any comments or questions or suggestions on what you want to hear on the show next, uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter and you can message me there as well. See you on the next episode.